All right, welcome back to the IOI podcast. Today, I got a new guest on today. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jenna Heilman, Executive Director of the Huntington's Disease Youth Organization, or HDO, as we call it. That's cool. How'd you get into it? I really have had a passion of serving the population of rare diseases, and after a transition from a previous opportunity, I found this organization, and they were looking for an executive director, and my background is really in helping uh, nonprofits in a transitionary time and just enhance what they're already doing, and um, have really enjoyed getting to know this organization. I personally don't have um, a familial connection with Huntington's disease, but over the past uh, few months since I've started, I've had the, the great pleasure of getting to know so many great people in the community and learning their stories and understanding how we can be of better service to them. Right. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so basically, what is it that you do now for this uh, the organization you're with now? Well, I'm the executive director. So right. really, I'm just helping connect all of the different moving parts together working with pharmaceutical companies to really communicate the challenges that especially young people, but really the whole structure of support systems around people who are impacted by Huntington's disease, what their life is like and how they can be a better service in order to help drive clinical research forward in a way that's meaningful, um, impactful, and then also timely, as as we know that this disease um, does affect so many people. Um, and then also just to help propel our mission forward, which is really to support, educate, and empower young people and families who have been impacted by HD. Right. Yeah. I mean, because you probably work with a lot of families. I mean, how do they go about, you know, like reaching you, reaching out, or how do you find them? Or, you know, what's the process on that? It's just like anything else. Uh, there's a little bit of word of mouth. We have a great social media presence. We have some support groups. We've done camps in person, obviously, before COVID. Yeah. Um, we work with associations and clinics across the globe to help reach out to the community. We have a fantastic website that we just relaunched with Enhanced Navigation. Um, so a lot of those different ways. And, and even just people by Googling Huntington's disease will pop up. And um, we were really one of the pioneering, if not the pioneering organization 10 years ago to get started that really focused on young people. Uh, previously, and, and oftentimes, people focus on, um, on HD and the impacts of the person who has been affected or who has been clinically diagnosed with Huntington's disease. That typically happens later in life, yeah. but even as that happens, the effects are felt by the whole family structure. So you have children and, you know, and, and young people is really, what we describe as really under 35. So mm -hmm. sometimes people think of young people just as children, but it is the whole breadth of, of what a young person is when you think of the transition and emotional and mental development and things like that, that they're going through. And then all of a sudden you have a parent or a grandparent or a guardian or a loved one who is changing for no reason that you don't understand why and their roles change with it. So you have people who are you know, children who are becoming caregivers. You have people who are abandoning what they um, have planned going to college or being in high school and all of those normal day-to-day -day activities where all of a sudden their lives are just turned upside down because of, of a loved one getting diagnosed with Huntington's disease. So people weren't really focusing on that true impact of the disease and, and HDO really came in and said, let's be the voice of young people and, and to help them because it is such a challenging disease to watch someone go through um, and sometimes being at risk yourself or testing positive yourself and understanding that, um, that uh, you could also be exhibiting some of those symptoms uh, coming up uh, as you get older. Right. Yeah. You know, um, you know, I guess, you know, my whole deal with the Huntington's is like, you know, it runs in my family. You know, my mom has it, uh, her sister has it. And I think her sister actually got it when, you know, she was probably thirties, maybe late twenties, you know? And so 
she uh you know that's kind of the youth one that you, you know for your guys is you know under 35 you know rank mm-hmm. so you know that's when I think you know she got it now she's probably like 40 something but yeah it does really progress a lot fast you know my mom you know she found out probably when she was 42 or something and didn't say nothing for a few years or whatever you know because you know nobody really you know really wants to know that but you know it's not a, it's not something you know you really even as me you know I don't really want to get you know tested or something I, I just you know I'm not ready for it yet but you know it's just kind of a scary thing but you know my grand grandfather had it too you know he passed away from it but you know he, his siblings also had it uh, I think one of them's like 80 some years old now and I just like I didn't I have no idea that you know someone someone can live that long you know with that disease you know but yeah it's just a really it's really it's a really different disease you know and like you said it's kind of it's rare you know and not it's not as uh put out there as you know say cancer or something else like that along those lines so that's why you know I reached out to you guys just to you know really hear your guys's input on what you know everything that you do and you know, uh, what you got going on. Cause I mean, I, I've seen that you, the youth one is a little bit different, right? Cause it progresses faster. And, uh, what, what else would you say this differs from, you know, getting it when you're 40 or, you know, s- symptoms wise? Well, a couple of, of distinguishing factors. Uh, first of all, um, Huntington's disease is hereditary. It right. is passed on from, um, from familial ties. And anybody who's, um, people are basically at a 50% chance of being at risk as living in a family with HD. And um, essentially what happens is, is that all of us have a Huntington gene um, that really helps produce Huntington protein, that the Huntington protein is essential to brain function. Um, What happens when someone is what we call gene positive is that there is um, DNA, C, A, and G DNA, that is becomes mutated. And it is called, um, it's a CAG repeat. And the higher the repeat, the more severe and the, the sooner symptoms can become onset. And so that's when you see people, um, you know, typically in the age of people who see the onset of symptoms, which can be mild to start off with, and they may not even know that those are symptoms of HD. Um, Those come in 40, 50, 60, sometimes 70, 80 later in life. Whereas when you have a higher repeat, that's when you tend to see some of those juvenile onset symptoms. And that's really 18 and younger. And that is kind of the rarest of the rare. But anybody can really be tested um, at the beginning of life. Uh, We have people who go through IVF or other fertility options and they, um, if they are gene positive or their loved one is gene positive, they may go through genetic testing prior to implantation. So then that way they can find those, um, that 50% that has not um, had that gene mutation, that genetic mutation. Um, So it is something that people have inside of them. Some people just have this mutation that eventually manifests into symptoms. So just a little bit of a clarification on on those kinds of things. And what we see is very similar to your um, situation to where when someone's misdiagnosed, um, especially when you think about the older generations, because of the symptoms can come in a variety of different aspects. You can have movement symptoms, and that's really the most common that people see. They call it the chorea, where it, it, which, is a, um, which means dance, essentially. And so you see people moving in a certain way. Sometimes people think that they're intoxicated if they don't know any right. better, um, yeah. but really it's uncontrollable movements, um, makes it hard to eat, drink, swallow, you know, all of these different challenges when it comes to what we think of as movements. Then there's the other aspect of mind. This can come from being forgetfulness or or having forgetfulness or um, having trouble concentrating, you know, those kinds of changes, which um, those are less apparent to the outside person. So as as a loved one who's, you know, looking in, you may not see some of those changes. So if you're not aware that this is a part of you, those changes can go on without really being noticed. And then the other one is behavioral changes or mood. 
And that's where um, can be really challenging because someone can change their mood within an instance. So someone who may be really calm, demeanored and, and nice and things like that could all of a sudden change and be angry. Um, a lot of people, again, especially in older populations were diagnosed with, um, with, uh, with mental illness. And so then they were hospitalized in, um, in, in, in a, a site in a center that's really derived, it's really for other people with mental illnesses, not someone with HD, because it's a completely different thing. And so what we've seen is that there are family structures who just didn't know that this was within their family until later on, as people got more aware of what the symptoms were for Huntington's, uh, there are more doctors who are trained in it, more, um, just more information is out there. And so then um, people now and now are becoming more aware and it's important to get that information out there because there has been such a stigma around it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's, you know, that's really what we're trying to do is provide a lot of that information and resources and support because there are, there's so many different scenarios that people have experienced, um, and, and just to help be there to be someone to listen to, um, or to listen to you. And, and that's really how HGO started was really creating that community around, um, around these families. All right. No, that's, that's good. I'm glad you guys are out there and doing that. You know, I never really, you know, ever heard about it. And so I started, I, like you said, you, I, you looked up, you know, Huntington's and then you, you'll find it, you know, but I never really did a lot of research on it or anything like that. And your, your guys' website is, you know, really helpful because there's like, it has categories too, you know, for kids, if it's a kid reading it or a young adult or, you know, someone older. And then there's all these options where you can, you know, dive into and there's all these, you know, categories and, uh, you know, some about having kids or, you know, and then like for, you know, preparing for, life to end that was like another one I seen like on the older version or the older people but I mean yeah you guys also you know have like uh form groups and stuff with people right that you know even if it's mainly like a lot of online groups you would say or is there like in-person ones well right now everything has has had to be online yeah. because of COVID uh, but we do have two really active Facebook groups. One is for young people, and then one is also for parents and family members. And so there are challenges which each of those subgroups of people because of their needs and what they're going through. And what you'll see is that it's, it's managed by HDO, but we have such an amazing community in each of these groups that if someone posts a question or has a thought or just needs someone to say that they understand, immediately people will will comment and you know send whatsapp chats and whatsapp chats and you know message and try to make that connection we also have our ambassador group which is a group of young people across the globe who are helping hdo in a variety of different ways one of those ways is that if there's someone that people wanted to get in contact with or if they live in an area that doesn't necessarily have an association or a really good support network around them, we can help uh, connect someone in, the, you know, close to where they live, which is helpful. And um, because there are so many different challenges across this world as far as access to care um, against the stigma where there's certain cultures that are not very open about what it's like to be impacted by HD. And so just not, just knowing that you're not alone is right. half the battle because yeah. because it can be so isolating yeah no that's for sure you know and because it's just it's just a really weird disease you know i mean it really 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 uh progresses you know like you said it can be fast or slow it's just kind of different in every situation but similar kind of symptoms and stuff you know and that's good that people have someone to say hey i know what you're going through or hey uh, let, let's talk or you know, let's, you know, I don't know, you know, if they're even in person, maybe they can hang out if they're able to, you know, because it just all depends on the stage or whatever, you know what I mean? But what is, I guess, uh, you know, I, I've seen you guys have like donations going on and stuff right now. What are, what are those ones about? 
Well, so we just wrapped up Giving Tuesday, which is the largest philanthropic day of the year, especially in the U.S. Um, we had a fantastic day of support. We had people sharing their stories. And we really look at these efforts as a way to build awareness around HD and to spread that education around um, as well as a fundraising avenue for HDO because we can't exist without the support of our of our um, of our community that we serve. Mm -hmm. um, and so we always accept donations, but that was that was a really uh, great push to help propel us into 2022 as we wrap up year end. I, again, especially in the U.S. with having um, you know tax season coming to a close, we are always encouraging donations. And yeah. um, just a, as a background, we don't charge for our program. So we are hosting an international virtual Congress in March, uh, to where we're going to have the latest in research up updates, pharmaceutical companies present mm -hmm. the ability to hear from personal stories and chat with different um, organizations across the globe and with other people who have been impacted. That is completely free for our pay, for our uh, young people and families to attend, and really the public. And so that's a perfect example of a way that um, by supporting HDO through generosity of donations, you can help support those types of programs. Or right. we also one thing that's that's really cutting edge is um, our juvenile onset HD registry. Um, it's called Join HD. There's very little known about juvenile onset HD. Because, like, as I mentioned, it's it's a very small population of this very rare disease. Yeah. Um, but there's a great opportunity to start looking at clinical research for these these kids who are directly affected by HD. So we are working with some pharmaceutical companies um, who are sponsoring this effort to uh, locate patients and family members of people who have been impacted by JOHD to help connect them to other people, understand what they've been going through in hopes of um, coming up with some great research that can be done in order to help these patients in the future. And so this is a worldwide effort to help locate people impacted by JOHD. And we're really just launching this. But again, these are these are essential programs um, that we continue to need funding for. Um, and then we also have a great mentorship program and partnership with the Huntington's Disease Society of America to where we're doing a mentorship program for young people that will pair someone in the community with a mentor who's also in the community so they can have that peer-to-peer -peer interaction and support. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's another great way just to connect with people. And um, sometimes you just need someone to, to talk to on a really entry level kind of way at, at your own level of, of age and, and experience and those kinds of things. Yeah, that's really cool. And then that's what it, yeah, I mean, cause that's what I was wondering where it went to, you know, and stuff, but yeah, that's, mm -hmm. yeah, you gotta have funds for that. And, you know, that's really cool that you guys get to do all that stuff and it's, you know, free for the people that are wanting being in the group and stuff. But, you know, like you said, you got to get funding to, you know, to support those kind of things, you know. So, yeah, that makes sense. What do you have? Is it just like a, on your link on the Instagram or that you have? Or? You go to hdo.org. Yeah. Really simple. We've got a donate button there that people can donate. We've got two different options. We've got... Um, an option if you live in the UK and then an option for everywhere else in the world to make that generous donation. $5 helps, yeah. $10 helps, a million dollars helps <laughs> even more, but you know, <laughs> I don't expect that to just come in online. Um, you can also donate through Instagram, through Facebook. There are so many different ways and we're always looking for volunteers too. So we have a variety of different committees of volunteers from research to marketing, um, education. We're possibly adding some more committees coming down the line, need people for ambassador program. And, um, you know, we're, we're always happy to, to connect folks. So there's so many ways to give back in addition to monetary donations. Yeah, that's really cool. I've seen, you know, like you were saying that they have a uh like an option too, where people share on, on their stories on their websites, right? And I've, I've read a few of them. And then I also seen, uh, you know, Matt's chats too, right? The founder of mm -hmm. your guys' organization, he was talking to a, can't remember her name, but she wrote a book about her sister that had it. 
you know, and Brave Brianna. Yeah, yeah, there it is, that one. And yeah, yeah. I, I sat there and watched it. I was like, yeah, that's a really good, you know, interview she did and a good, you know, good thing she did for her sister, you know, and that's really cool that they have, uh, that you guys do that too, you know, interview certain kind of people that have something to do, stories that have something to do with the, the Huntington disease. And he also was doing one with uh, the people that were working on, uh, you know, like a treatment or some kind of cure. Mm -hmm. Um, is, do you guys keep up on those as well? We do. Yep. So we host monthly match chats and really what we do is we try to provide a lot of the same information that's on our website or on research sites or just personal stories shared out there in a yeah. way that is very conversational for young people. Um, it, we all have very waning attention spans <laughs> and like to click through things quickly and things right. like that. So a lot of our social media is, is, um, developed for people to have that quick information and then they continue on for a longer time if they choose. So Matt Chats is a perfect example of having that conversation very casual um, with, a, with a variety of guests. You mentioned personal stories. We have sometimes pharmaceutical companies on there. We have people from our team, personal, you know, just all of these different things because these are the different topics in people's minds as they, mm -hmm. uh, as they go through this life impacted by HD. And then we also have, uh, we've partnered with HD Buzz. So HD Buzz is kind of the leading uh, online magazine that shares really comprehensible information about what's going on in the world of research. But if you were to go and read about this research on uh, a pharmaceutical or medical page, it might be really hard to understand. I yeah. know sometimes I have a hard time and this <laughs> is what I do. Yeah. But HD Buzz really breaks it out into a conversational piece. And what we do is we take that information, we turn it into about one to two minute long videos where yeah. people, again, on social media, get the gist of the information and then they can read and learn a little bit more. So again, it's taking that communication and making it in a way that's applicable for our community of folks. And so those are another great way of trying to provide that education and those tools for people um, as they as they face everyday life. Yeah, because I seen on the Instagram, there's definitely like little uh, cartoons that you guys do like those two, two little mini, they're like little cartoons, animated kind of things on there. Mm -hmm. and yeah, it's just like putting education out there for people and, you know, informing them about, you know, such and such. But yeah, I really like that, you know, because it is hard to get people's attention, you know, for, you know, if it's just something for like 10 minutes, you know, no one's really going to want to watch unless they get a little piece of it. And they're like, oh, okay, this is interesting. Let me check this out. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, you know, just having information out there isn't enough. We need to have it um, engaging in right. a way that people um, want to learn more. And that's why working with these partners who already do such a great job and, and just helping bridge that gap is so important. Yeah, no kidding. Do you, you, so do you guys also follow up with the, you know, clinical trials and everything that people mm -hmm. are doing and stuff like that? So what, what is, I guess, there was a, the recent one that got shut down, right? That they were doing maybe at the <laughs> beginning of this year? Yep. So there are a couple that have paused. We don't know um, exactly what that means yet. They're hoping mm -hmm. to release some information um, in the next few months, hopefully, to understand um, is this something that they can go back and adapt um, and kind of start over with the clinical trial process? What does that mean? But there's a lot of exciting stuff that's happening in research. Um, mm -hmm. There are some clinical trials that have been fast-tracked recently, have been approved by the FDA to really start uh, accruing patients to participate. We're seeing this in the U.S. and then also mm -hmm. expanding across the globe. Um, so I would say really hang out on clinicaltrials.gov. That's where you're going to find a lot of the information out there um, as far as what clinical trials that might be available for you if you're looking for one, if, if someone um, is interested in participating and understanding. I will tell you that the majority or all of these clinical trials are really around the, uh, the onset of symptoms. So a lot of them are treating some of the symptomatic pieces of it with hopes that it will help reduce or um, uh, delay some of the other symptoms coming on. So they want people who do have the onset of symptoms. One of the things we're pushing for is, is there an opportunity to 
knowing that people can get tested um, for their whole life, they can know if they're positive. Um, you know, is there an opportunity for them to participate in clinical trials? Because there is this length of time between birth and onset of symptoms that could there be a way for people to participate in order to um, provide that information, look at the repeat, see if it's lessening, things like that. So, um, but there's, there's, there has been a lot of attention. And, and one thing that's, um, that's interesting about HD is that while these are completely different diseases, there are similarities between Parkinson's and yeah. Alzheimer's and, um, and, uh, ALS and, and MS. And so I guess not ALS, MS mostly, and, but there's, um, a lot of drugs that have been developed for one or the other that they're looking to see, could this be tweaked and help the symptom of this type of neurological, neurological, can't even talk neurodegenerative <laughs> disease. Yeah. And so there are some parallels being drawn to where if that happens, then they don't have to go through that it's already been approached to the FDA. So they don't necessarily have to start from square one. Mm -hmm. They can take it and say, okay, we already have this data to say that this drug does this, this, and this. Our theory is adjusting it for this disease base to see if it can help with these symptoms, which is, which is helpful because then you sidestep some of that regulatory, um, those regulatory things they have to do if it's a brand new drug. So there, there are some really exciting things coming down the line. Um, I think being your own advocate is important. And if you are someone who has HD in your family, if you're positive, have a loved one who uh, has symptoms, I would encourage everyone at any point to talk to your doctor about clinical trials, because that is really the way forward to help, um, to hopefully help yourself, but also help others. Yeah, that is true. I mean, because that's the only way they're ever going to really ever find a, you know, good treatment or a good cure or whatever it, you know, may be. But yeah, that is, that's for sure. Everybody's got to do research on something. When did this, you know, start, I guess, when the Huntington disease, when was it discovered? Was it in like the 1800s or something like that? Do you know, I think? Yes. I'm trying to think back <laughs> to my history of HD side of things. It, it, I mean, it's because I would say the discovery of Huntington's was, it was about that time. I yeah. would honestly, I, I don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, <laughs> I could Google it right now and cut this out if you want. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, Huntington was one of the people who helped discover the gene and the reason for this. I know that the symptoms, of course, um, were misdiagnosed for a long time. So yeah. I think that trying to find the, the true start date of when H developed in humans would be challenging, but there is yeah. definite, definite timeline to when um, the mutation was discovered and they put a name to it. Yeah, because I mean, it's probably pro not progressed, but I mean, yeah, I guess progressed as a as a whole disease. I mean, people become more aware of it, you know, from when it first started to where it is now, you know, I mean, it's probably got to be insane for how much, you know, their support and, and treatments going on for it you know, and everything like that. I mean, yeah. Awareness is a big piece. Awareness is a big piece and understanding that there's no reason to be embarrassed by it, because I think that that has been something that if it's, since this disease has been highly stigmatized because of the outward appearance of it and trying to, and because of the, um, the mood changes and the, the mind changes and things along those lines, um, people have, just kind of been hush hush about it. And so that has really lifted. There are still a lot of cases of that, but that's really lifted um, over the past several decades even. Um, and so that helps propel the need, the, the support for research, the support for people, um, support for organizations and education because knowledge is power and it yeah. allows you to have options. No, I mean, that is true. You know, I mean, it's good to have to get spread the awareness whenever you can. I mean, uh, I know you guys, you know, like you said, you have the events, you got the website and everything. And I also seen that you, you guys like have clothing too, that you guys kind of make like hats and, you know, shirts. We hoodies. Some, we've got 
some merchandise. We're going to have some new stuff coming on soon, um, which is great. One of the shirts that we're going to have on there is ask me about Huntington's disease because that's um, a lot. We've heard some some scenarios to where people with a loved one they're going who has HD going in the grocery store and hearing people snicker behind their backs or making ignorant yeah. comments like you know it, it's, yeah. it's unfortunately human nature to when you see something different your mind goes in a different way when it really should be a little bit more compassionate and understanding and curious yeah. and so um just not being afraid to talk about hd and to have a blatant shirt that says ask me about Huntington's disease. And yeah. I, I don't know about you, if you've seen some of those event shirts in the U S to where it yeah. has like, I'm a survivor on the back of it. I'll stop and ask people, you know, tell me about your journey. And so the hope is, is, is for the general public to understand about HD because people in the community know about it, but really in order to uh, propel and expedite these kinds of, of, um, uh, services and research efforts, we need the general public support and understanding. And because it's such a rare disease and it's not something that, um, that you can get unless it's in your gene makeup, it's not like cancer. It's not, yeah. um, like all time, you know, there are just certain other diseases that are more, um, that aren't as rare that people don't always connect to because there's not an opportunity for it to impact yourself or a loved one, then it's hard for people to, to really understand or spend the time to get to know about it. So I think yeah, just being open-minded and, and curious and sharing your story. Yeah. And that, that's good. That is a great way to, you know, really put that out there and, you know, spread the word even more just by putting that, you know, ask me about it. You know, it's obvious, you know, you can, like you said, people were making, you know, might have made comments to someone or, you know, whatever the situation was. But then, you know, once, you know, that say the person that was wearing the shirt turned around, they're like, oh, shit, now I feel bad because, you know, I, <laughs> yeah, you know, what I mean, like, oh, I feel bad because I was saying mm -hmm. that, you know, but then, you know, maybe it, they're like, oh, what is that? You know, but, you know, it just any situation they can, uh, you know, someone will see that and maybe ask them, you know, and then there you go. Now someone's informed with just because they're wearing a shirt, you know, what I mean, and then you talk to them and have Teachable that conversation. moments. Yeah. You never know. <laughs> yeah, teachable moments are huge. Absolutely. Because, you know, we all say stuff that we want to take back right. after it leaves our face. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but allowing someone to educate you on on why what you said is incorrect or insensitive or misinformed uh, is really important for, for all aspects of life, um, especially with Huntington's disease. Yeah, that's true. When was, I guess, your, your kind of like your uh, click moment when you knew you wanted to be into, you know, the whole disease, you know, scene? Because you said you had a previous job that, yeah. that you were doing with a different disease, right? Uh, yeah. So I, um, I don't know, you know, life just happens yeah. and you find, you find your passion and you find your niche and, um, with the diseases that I've worked with, it's not anything that um, I, I have personally dealt with, but I can tell you that after being in this space for, for years, you quickly develop those extended family moments. And mm -hmm. um, in, in the ability to be there for someone and to provide helpful information, not just from Google, but ways of getting around scenarios and in such an important time, oftentimes the most difficult time is something that, that I'm extremely proud of and, and passionate about. And so I think that by helping folks in these rare disease areas, um, now Huntington's disease, it helps feed my soul while helping the greater good, which is to really advocate, educate, to um, work with different pharmaceutical and medical partners and, uh, and to make a, a, a big difference. And while I'm not naive enough to think that, um, that anything I do is going to help solve this problem, I would like to um, be a part of this, the greater solution and to help someone today and tomorrow and the next day. And I think that that's what's so great about HDO is that we have such a passionate group of staff 
board members, uh, volunteers, committee members who all feel the same way and understand the great need that we all serve. And so um, it's just a really special group of people. All right. And, uh, you know, I really like that you're doing that. And you, I mean, to what you said, though, about not being, you know, what you, what you do doesn't, you know, impact the cure or whatever, but like, it's still, what you do is very important, you know, and it's really, you know, spreading the word and getting it out there and getting other people help at the same time, you know? And so, yeah, I would say, you know, you know, definitely you getting the voice and the awareness out there definitely does make an impact, even if you're not, you know, within the lab with your glass scientist suit and everything, you know what I mean? But you're, yeah. you're definitely in there making an impact to, you know, making a research or a cure possible because without a voice, you know, there's no one's going to hear it. Nobody's going to be aware of it. Nobody's going to know about it. So, I mean, there's got to be a voice to everything, you know, that a movement or whatever it may be, you know? Yeah. And I think that, and again, encouraging the public to learn more because you've seen this with other diseases, like in the eighties and early nineties with breast cancer and having this huge movement of people surrounding this awareness drive and that really propelled funding and that pro uh, propelled legislative changes and, you know, things like that. Um, we haven't, to my knowledge, really seen that big of a movement in any kind of disease space. And yeah. so, um, you know, understanding for the public to understand that there are real people who are suffering and uh, they need our help and to get involved is, is so important. So, you know, things like paying attention to what's happening in Congress um, as far as like access to care, even something as simple as that can make a difference. So, um, you know, for example, if you, if, if Medicare or Medicaid it has to wait for a certain length of time for someone to be enrolled in that program and someone is having the onset of symptoms and they can't wait that long to go see a doctor, you know, how can we advocate through our personal stories um, to our Congress people and senators to say, hey, this is not okay because this is what's happening during that length of time that people right. can't get access to care. You know, simple things like that can be applied to so many different disease bases. Mm. Um, you know, so, so even thinking outside the box of what are you hearing happening? How could that impact someone else's experience? And I think too often, um, people tend to really just focus on what's happening in their own world. Um, mm. And it's important to kind of put yourself in other people's shoes and see, you know, how can you help your, your friend over here, your neighbor, um, yeah. someone even across the globe, you know, some, some little acts can really make a big difference. No, I'm, you're absolutely right. You know, that's why, you know, I love doing interviews with all kinds of different people and, you know, including yourself because, it gives you, you know, a perspective of what's, what else is going on. You get to hear someone else's story, you know, and understand it, you know, and if everybody knew each other's story, you know what I mean? If everybody would get along, you know, more, more than what they would be do now, you know, so much more, mm -hmm. you know, but th that's why, you know, yeah, what you said, it makes sense. You know, it's just, you got to like, hear people's stories and what they're going through and why. And like you said, it's just those little things, put yourself in other people's shoes, you know, hear them out, you know, because you never know what's going on or what they might be going through or why that's unfair to them, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It, Finding that common ground is important. Yeah. What motivates you to do what you do every day? Uh, the people do. I mean, just getting to know their stories and how we can help them. Um, and again, it's not solving their problems uh, by any means. Sometimes it is, you know, sometimes their problems can be solved by providing the right resources or mm -hmm. connecting with other people. But it's, it's really just making those extended family members. And uh, we, we participate in a group that's called um, HD CAB, mm -hmm. um, Community Advisory Board is what that stands for. Excuse me, and that is an inter international group of people. We partner with um, the European Huntington's Association and the International Huntington's Association, and we have a group of um, of people from all different countries, different experiences. Whether they're a caregiver, are at risk themselves, positive, negative, you know, mm -hmm. all of these these different backgrounds, um, and to 
to get to watch through these ad board meetings with different groups and pharmaceutical companies to share their story in a way, and, and I'm sure they've shared it a hundred times, but getting the chance to watch their eyes open um, and the pure joy and relief and camaraderie that they feel when they see other people who are going through the same thing um, and how impactful that these different situations can be for, for everybody, it, it's almost therapeutic for them. And so mm. to be able to make that happen and encourage them and, and you know, oftentimes support them with whatever they need is so, so fulfilling and gratifying. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, everybody has reasons what they do, but when, when those situations come up, my, my feel good reader just, yeah. and it, you know, it just helps propel you the next day and the next. Yeah, no kidding. That is a good way. That is a good one. I like that. Where would you like to, you know, see yourself in 10 years with this? I'd like to be out of a job. <laughs> yeah, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? Everybody. Yeah. Be... <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, if they People have... always kind of look at you funny, like, what does that mean? Well, I think, you know, not, I, I, I think that no matter what, we'll have to um, to still keep going. But I think our yeah. ultimate goal is to to have viable treatment and, um, you know, if not a cure to be able to help people, um, yeah. and, and to not have to, to do the things that we do. Of course, there's, there's so many different interesting, uh, <laughs> intricate parts of, of what we do, but, right. um, you know, that would, it would be great to have, uh, have, have more treatments available to help with symptoms and then maybe even lessening of the, the gene mutation. Yeah, no, I know, I knew what you mean when you said that, but no, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, th I think either way, you guys would probably still be around, you know, and, you know, trying to yeah. get, get people to cure in, in some kind of way, you know, you, you'd adapt, you know what I mean? And I, I mean, cause you helped so how many people for years, you know what I mean? So I, w I wouldn't think it just, you know, go away. I think it would adapt to something different, you know, even exactly in any sense, you know what I mean? Oh, that's cool. Yeah, 7,000 families, in fact, that we've helped in the past 10 years, which is Damn. amazing considering how rare this disease is. Yeah, that is a lot of families right there. I mean, because when you think about the numbers of how many people or how many, mm -hmm. you know, families may have it, you just, you don't really think it, it's not a whole lot, you know, compared to the whole world. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's still, there's a lot of people, even that small percentage that those are their people too, you know, they, they have their lives and it's just crazy. I mean, because I've never... Yeah. I've never met anybody in my whole life that had the disease or a, a different family or heard anything. I just always known it as in my family, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. so I've never, yeah. never met anybody like that. Yeah. It's kind of weird. I never even really thought about it like that <laughs> until now, you know, I yeah. just know I've never heard of it, <laughs> you know, but yeah, hopefully, you yeah. know, with, <laughs> in 10 years, that would be nice, you know, but you know, let's just see what, what comes and what comes about, but. So just got to keep plugging along and working hard. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, that's all I had to really ask you. Did you have anything else you wanted to add or bring up, you know, before we wrap it up? I think, you know, just, just showing support in a lot of different ways, volunteering, yeah. listening, donating, um, becoming educated. You know, there's so many ways to help out. So I just encourage people to, to learn more and stay tuned for hopefully some exciting information. And, and, you know, if you're, if you're curious about HD, sign up for our Congress, like I said, it's free. So it's March 5th and 6th, uh, 2022. Mm -hmm. We're going to have two, four hour sessions, again, a variety of different research updates, uh, personal journey stories, topics about genetic testing, other, other types of comments and, and, you know, things about fertility and, family choices and family planning and you know all of these other topics that are really important to the community but it's a great way to to meet other people as well and to chat with folks who are going through similar circumstances is that on the zoom or something like that uh it's actually it's yes it's going to be on a platform um we have a website it's called uh, you can find it on our website at hdo.org it's also uh, hdocongress.gfairs.com and um, that's a third party company that helps facilitate uh, virtual conferences and um, they all of the sessions will be uh, recorded as well so even afterwards if you're not able to attend 
we'll have the information on our YouTube channel. Um, and the, the sessions are on YouTube um, from last year as well. So oh, cool. uh, the difference with that is that you just obviously won't be able to chat with people, but we're going to have specific chat rooms for um, different demographics. Like if you're um, a young person, if you're a family member, if you're interested in chatting with people about juvenile onset HD, uh, if you live in different parts of the world. So that's a really great way um, or a reason to attend is, is just to connect with others too. Yeah, that sounds cool. I'll have to check it out. You know, I'm, um, yeah. I'm going to check out everything else too on the website too, the donations and, you know, really get to, I don't know, I'll probably donate a little bit too, you know, just to, uh, that's so nice. <laughs> just a little, no, whatever great. I got, you know what I mean? Cause I, I, I well, always looked. This- no, no, like I've always looked for places to like donate, you know what I mean? For the Huntington disease, either the research or organizations, but I just never really found any. And then I just didn't know, even if I did, I just didn't know if it was, you know, a scam or not, but you, because there's, you know, a lot of scams on the internet, but obviously I don't, you guys, <laughs> isn't, you know what I mean? But no, I, I have to, you know, cause I always wanted to, you know what I mean? That's, that's so awesome. And I mean, even just letting us come on and, and chat a little bit to your listenership. I mean, that's huge because, um, again, it's really about spreading that awareness and information. Um, but, you know, I'm going to do another donation plug because we do, you know, there are a lot of companies out there who match donations too. Oh, so yeah. if you work for a, com- a company that does that, we can do, you know, monthly donations, even for if you um, sacrificed a cup of coffee every month, you can have yeah. that roll out of your bank account to, to HCO. So uh, there's a lot of great ways to get involved. If you like to participate in activities, like if you're uh, a marathon runner or a cyclist or a swimmer or any any kind of activity to where you can pick a charity to raise money for, we've got different platforms to do that. And we're happy to help you to do that. We had... Um, someone in the UK who did a, um, a half marathon in Damn. August and um, raised about, uh, I think, like $6,000 for us. Damn, really? So we, Yeah, that's mm-hmm. a lot. <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah. That's a good one right there. I'm, it's great, you know, when you hear of these great stories. And, and the important thing is, a lot, I think a lot of people get nervous about um, fundraising because they don't want to... Um, put people in a weird spot by asking them for money or, or and also kind of feel they don't want to get rejected. Um, right. you know, especially during these times and we completely understand that the world's in a crazy place right now, but people want to support people that they love. And yeah. so even if they say not this time, maybe next time, they're not going to be offended by it. They're, they're going to be excited to, to support you because they love you and so um i that's just my little tangent on not being scared to try something new into <laughs> fundraiser organizations whatever it might be yeah but we're here to help yeah absolutely well thank you for coming on i appreciate you taking out about 45 minutes of your time you know i appreciate it thank you for doing what you do you know and helping everybody out that you do help you know because that that you really are making an impact on a lot of people's lives you know a lot of families you guys I mean, you guys said that you did 7,000, you know, that's, that's, that's a good number, you know, so keep at it and just keep doing what you do. Thank you. Well, thank you so Thank you for having me and thanks for all of your support and, and so excited we got to connect. Yeah, absolutely. Nice meeting you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye.